Welcome to Out of the Groove, ladies and gentlemen. This week, I am joined by Matt Tift. Matt, thank you for being on the show. Glad we can make this work. Yeah, well, thanks for uh, having me. I guess I'm a longtime listener, first time caller sort of a deal here. So I appreciate you having me on. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's been a really busy week. I, I want to ask you, after the three and a half day delay at Texas, what is the craziest race weekend you've ever been a part of? Oh, um, you know, it wasn't so much a race weekend part of it, but it did have to do with the rain delay. And uh, I was going, this is years ago, um, we're at a K&N race in Richmond and uh, the race got rained out and um, it ended up butting up against my senior prom. So uh, yeah, so <laughs> needless to say, um, I was a little bit stressed out for that. Obviously we're going racing. So the night before we're racing, the next day we are supposed to go to, I'm supposed to fly back and go to prom and everything. So my date knew that, uh, that I was, you know, racing. And um, so of course it gets rained out and I think I got 33 calls from her best friend uh, trying to tell me that I had to come back and everything. And it's like, well, um, I, yeah, I would have understood after the first time, but 32 more times after that, she's still trying to make her point for her friend that was my date. So um, <laughs> long story short, we ran the race. I, um, I ended up driving from Richmond to DC Flew home from D.C., landed in Cleveland because um, I was still living in Ohio, and uh, got off the plane, got to my house about 25 minutes later, threw on the tux, didn't even shower from after the race. So still nasty, wow. but ha had to make it back, you know, for it. Pick and, and choose your uh, battles, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So made it to it, and um, needless to say, my day was not very happy with me. I don't know if she talked to me much the entire night after all that freaking effort to get there, but whatever so yeah brain delays are not always a good thing um but when it's your full-time job and you're not in high school like you know about a decade after that uh it, it was fine but uh yeah that one was definitely a very stressful one especially her best friend calling about 33 times that feels like something out of like a, a nickelodeon you know high school movie that you'd see oh. like <laughs> like that be the race car driver that's late for prom and you know, oh there's the gosh. drama i mean it writes itself that that well that's a pretty <laughs> hilarious story yeah well uh, well the worst part was the first 10 to 15 calls somehow she got my dad's number which nobody has my dad's number so <laughs> calls he's sitting there like, next <laughs> yeah well and i'm driving for straighter and so he's he's out in the lounge or something like that i'm saying out with the guys he's like who does this number keep calling me? it's like a spam call but you know they they'll give up after three or four tries and uh this girl's going on for 10 or 15 with him and she finally goes um, who is this and then um yeah obviously referred me to my number for me to get tormented at that point <laughs> wow well very per persistent um <laughs> well I, I do want to talk about this because you've been in the news recently last week it was announced that you and and bj mcleod were buying go fast's ownership of, of a charter honestly the charter system sometimes still goes over my head <laughs> who owns what how it works but uh maybe you can make some sense for me how did this deal come together sure. Yeah, so I guess first of all, on the details there, so um, Archie St. Hilaire decided to get out of the sport. Um, I know he's not 100% because he's still going to do some part-time mm -hmm. racing next year, as his press release stated. But um, So basically, Joe Falk, he was still involved on that as a 50% owner, um, but Archie decided to sell out of there. So we um, had the opportunity during all this madness of, um, of everybody buying up charters and things being sold to kind of jump in and, and man, we got lucky. Um, you know, we ended up buying the 50% um, part of his charter in there. And so now, uh, basically, we own 50% of the charter. Joe uh, Falk works with us. And Joe's an awesome guy. So we've really enjoyed that. But um, but on the team side, BJ and I own 100% of the team and we operate on uh, that part of it. So basically what that allows us to do, you know, when you have um, these other charter announcements kind of coming out, basically Justin Marks is leasing the charter. Uh, we saw Michael Jordan and Denny Hamlin buy the charter there. So we do own you know um together 50 percent of that charter uh but we're here for the long haul and i think the purchasing of the charter uh, was such a big deal because that really solidifies us as being here for a very long time now obviously to go along with that there's budgeting uh there's you know personnel there's equipment all these things and, and we're excited to announce every part of that as we go along here as it gets finalized so we've been busy in the weeds uh trying to get that stuff done but um, the really cool thing is that, you know, being among the group that's that's in NASCAR now, but also that's coming up next um, is really exciting. And 
Um, it's a little bit of a weird time because you have next year being, you know, we've all thought the Gen 7, or, sorry, the next gen car was coming mm -hmm. uh, next year. But, um, you know, because of COVID and everything going on, it's been pushed back to 2022. So we kind of have a strange year, you know, in between. Um, but we are committed to buying that next gen car and, and being a part of the next chapter of schedules and things and everything changes in 22. Interesting. So with multiple people involved, you mentioned Joe Falk and obviously BJ McLeod. Do y'all, how do y'all divide up the work? And if so, uh, what is your specific role with the new team? Yeah. So, you know, on the team side, like I said, it's really BJ and I that run the team over there. So Joe um, on the charter side, you know, he is, he's very involved on the NASCAR side. So when we go to um, the meetings and have those things, you know, he is very involved in that and has been for, for many, many years. So that's where we really um, get a lot of help from him. Um, but also he likes to come to the racetrack when he can. And, and, you know, when people are allowed back to the track, he just loves to come to the track, but um, you know, he's been around long enough too to know that, Hey, if the team needs a part or needs something you know we all kind of the three of us get come together and say what do we need to run better or if we need to fix a part whatever it may be so um joe is great on that side of things bj uh, a lot of people don't realize this but um he was actually the first one who ever told me oh we might have an appearance from my cat chloe over here so everybody this is chloe if she comes in uh, but uh he was actually the first one that taught me um to drive a race car so i was 11 years old and I went down to New Smyrna Speedway and BJ was an instructor down there while he was running his late model program mm -hmm. and uh, ended up doing really well down at the racing school. And we decided afterwards that uh, that I would go to Speed Weeks down there and run a late model with him. So we went and did that. Uh, myself and Scott Heckert were um, teammates with um, his late model team that he owned uh, back in 2010 and 11 uh, in 2012 before they went k and racing. And then um, I ran my first truck series race with BJ in 2014 at Martinsville and got a top 10 out of that. And so we've stayed friends a very long time and uh, been, you know, just off the track, you know, last year and the year before that, we go to movies on Friday night and um, just go hang out and have dinner. So we've had a long relationship. He was a groomsman in my wedding. And so um, wow. I don't think a lot of people knew that we were, you know, kind of tied together. But, um, you know, he's very involved on the team operational side, what we need for um, parts and pieces and, and personnel running there. Now, I guess from my side, you know, really goes to the sponsorship side, the admin side, and then, um, you know, just making connections for that next gen car of where we go. Um, but then also, you know, going to social media engagement and things over there that, um, you know, that I've had a lot of experience in over the last few years with, um, you know, my driving that I've done, but then also even this last year with things that uh, I haven't been driving but been you know engaged on that side awesome interesting very interesting well i've heard nothing but good things about bj mcleod from all the people i've talked to they say he's amazing in the garage area so yeah uh, that, that sounds like a great partner sounds like a, a really cool deal you've talked about the next gen car obviously a lot of new teams are being introduced they're kind of all positioning themselves for the next gen car next next season uh, but what is it uh for, in your words at least what is it specifically about the new car that you think is so attractive to all these new team owners well, I think it's a couple things. So uh, first off, it's it's to try to bring more parity uh, to the sport. So, you know, we've seen with the new package and, and whether that's worked or hasn't worked in some places um, between 750 and 550 package, um, you know, basically what they're trying to get to is a place where there is a lot more parity over the field. So that's trying to bring up the speed of small teams like us. So I think the, the benefit to that is, you know, NASCAR is trying to get away from, you know, there being a big disparity between a large team that can go to the wind tunnel and spend millions upon millions of dollars um, and someone like us who just can't afford to do that. So um, obviously engineering has become such a big part um, of NASCAR here, um, you know, recently, but especially over the last decade or two. And, uh, you know, we don't have the big budgets as the big teams do to have a, a war room of engineers and, and things like that. So um, hopefully that part helps out. I think we've seen different um, iterations of that car as we've gone along, um, you know, with ideas as far as the package that we've ran, um, the all-star uh, package of last year, just different things we've tried to try to bring the cars closer 
it together. So that's definitely exciting for us that, you know, um, you know, in our 2021 season, we will be, do, um, you know, buying tires. We will be doing the right things to be competitive and hopefully pick up where the 32 car uh, kind of left off this year. Um, but at the same time, you know, you look ahead and I think that it's very attractive for a team like us to be able to have um, pieces and parts that you can just kind of swap and, and put on there. And, and right now, you know, you have a totally different car for a road course car compared to a downforce car. And I think the idea there is to try to get it to where you can swap a few components on those cars to make them um, go from track to track. So that's not something that we have right now. Obviously the bodies and everything change so much to get from um, track to track and, and race to race really. Um, so that's something I think they're trying to make it a little bit easier for us. Um, but the other part too, is we're talking about different schedules and we don't have a car um, right now that can be uh, maybe as versatile if we're trying to go to, you know, whatever they're trying to do, whether that be maybe um, more road courses, more maybe street courses. Obviously we have uh, Bristol dirt, um, which is crazy <laughs> and cool, but you know, I Something. don't see that coming out of anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so I think there's so many things coming with that. Um, that, uh, you know, hopefully we attract a new OEM into the sport. And uh, I think there's so many exciting things in there that being a part of it at this time in the beginning phase, hopefully it's kind of, you know, starting uh, for us into the next chapter of NASCAR as well. Yeah, it really is. I, originally, it felt like 2021 with the new schedule was going to be like the complete flip. And now it's sort of been delayed a year, but it still is a, a wild yeah. transition period. And you mentioned it at the very beginning, you know, guys like you and BJ McLeod and Michael Jordan and Denny Hamlin, even we are seeing like a shift in ownership, you know, no disrespect to any of the people at the very top, but you know, Roger Penske's in his eighties, you know, Joe Gibbs and Jack Rash, they're getting older. Like at some point NASCAR was going to need a new fresh crop of, of invested, talented, young team owners. So hopefully uh, guys like, like your team are going to fit that bill. So uh, it's exciting from a fan's yeah. perspective to watch as well. Um, I do want to ask about a, a possible driver. Have you guys made any decisions on who's driving or if there's going to be uh, uh, like next year with before the next gen car, is there going to be kind of a technical alliance form? Like, how is that going to work? Have you made any of those decisions just yet? Well, I, um, the official uh, pen has not been put to the paper on those, but we've had a lot of discussions in there. So um, our plan on that stuff is uh, postseason here is to be able to make an announcement on all those things. So um, having a driver uh, lineup announced, um, announced in there of who's going to be driving our car, um, who's going to be a technical alliance with us and our manufacturer and our team name. We haven't uh, put That's that true. one out there. So um, we do have all those things in the works that are there. Um, I can tell you that I know that a number and team name, but I can't say that one yet. So we're we're waiting waiting on that so you guys will just have to hold on a little bit but that one be coming soon um but yeah there's uh, there's certainly a lot of parts of our team that we're excited to announce but um you know with it being coming up to martinsville and phoenix here um we want to make sure that we announce at the right time and uh really hit out of the park with everything coming so um yeah we're, we're super excited for that part of it and um there's a lot of exciting things and i think a lot of people are going to be impressed with what we're doing Awesome. Well, we'll be looking forward to hearing that announcement for sure. Um, and then my last question really about the, the new team, uh, what are your short-term goals versus your long-term goals? I know you've mentioned you guys aim to be competitive, especially with the next gen car, but uh, maybe you can shed some more light on, on what your, your goals are. Yeah. Well, I think first of all, um, well, I'm glad you asked that question, but you know, first off, I want to make it very clear that we're not here to, to ride around and, and um, you know, just kind of be there, but even in 2021, um, you know, we're going to be doing the right things as far as the assets that we've um, purchased with the equipment we've gotten. So um, what that means is that we're probably, you know, we're shooting for a high twenties car uh, that, you know, maybe an attrition gets a 25th or top 20 finish in there. So that's where we kind of start off with. And that's, that's even, you know, shooting, the bar a little bit high in there you know realistically we should be probably if we were qualifying like normal we probably qualify around 30th and run in the high 20s somewhere in there so um, again what we're trying to do is pick up and leave off where the 32 car um, was doing so that's that's our number one goal from the gate is to show we are buying tires we do have a competitive pit crew and show that we are you know a legitimate team um, that is really trying to be there and be part of this next wave of NASCAR you know you mentioned um, as far as the ownership part of it i think bj and i are um two of the youngest uh, charter owners in nascar's history and and so that means that we do have a long-term plan because we want to be here for a long term so or a long time so 
in that long-term plan, you know, it really looks at each year building and trying to get better. Now, that may not be a budget difference for, um, you know, three years in there. We could get to the, the next gen car and hit a plateau of our budget. And we just try to refine our processes and run where we can in those um, areas. And, uh, and really, the sport comes down to money and funding to, to buy speed. So um, when we look at starting off, we know where we can be. We know that we are going to be good at paying payroll and doing the little things necessary to, to be there and be a legitimate team. Um, but going past that, you know, it's, it's creating those manufacturer relationships, those sponsor relationships that help us grow. Um, but really, if you look at those guys um, like Roger Pensy, like Team Hendrick, like Stuart Haas Racing, Richard Childress Racing, everybody started from somewhere. And we have a great starting spot, but we don't want to burn out in two or three years. You know, we're going to be very smart about how we spend our money. But at the same time, we want to be competitive. So the goal is for 20, 30 years is to be here to be a very competitive team. Um, and if we get sponsorship money, you know, sooner or later, uh, that could be two or three years down the line. You know, we could be a competitive team that has an alliance with somebody that, um, that could bring us to the next level. So um, those are the things we're trying to do is to build progressively and at a rate that makes sense that won't put us out of business. Like, unfortunately, we've seen um, not not the teams recently we've seen, but more of the teams that you've seen a one and done sort of a deal back in the early 2000s where they kind of jump in and jump out. So we're here for the long haul. We believe in what NASCAR is doing. And uh, we're excited to hit the track in February. Yeah, it sounds like there are a lot of people that are in a similar boat right now. They're very excited uh, about NASCAR's changing business model. Well, uh, it's great to hear that y'all have long-term aspirations. My final question for you, Matt, because you're in a unique position. You're sort of transitioning from being driver first to now a team yeah. owner, a partial team owner. Um, and you've very recently been a driver compared to even some mm -hmm. other team owners that have been drivers and things. You know, uh, what can you take uh, from your driving experience that you think will make you better as a team owner going forward? Well, first of all, because every day my Instagram and Twitter comments get blown up. I am not driving the car. I will put that out there first. I, I, I wasn't going to ask it straight. I didn't want to put you on the spot, but I was wondering. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Fair enough. No, no, I am not driving the car. I will put that out there. Now, people ask if I'm going to be, you know, sitting back in a cup car. I might take a picture of me, um, you know, sitting in the cup car because that would technically mean that I sat in a cup car again. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think it's, it's a unique... Um, thing that I've been able to do in my career because I've kind of had a I've had a strange career in, in a way because I've jumped up through series fast and I moved around from team to team to try to get to the next level and um, you know some of those things were really good decisions and some of them um, might have been a little bit too quick but um, ultimately you know I was able to get to the cup series with front row but um, going from Joe Gibbs racing to RCR you know there's very different ways of how those teams run you know each other's programs and then going to front row a totally different program of of how they were able to run their um, their team. So I think from a competitor standpoint, I know from the driver's side of what people are looking for when they come to a team, as does BJ. And from another standpoint on there, I know how the big teams operate as well. So having um, those connections of being in some top tier equipment and knowing the folks over there, I think as the years go on, the funding becomes available. Uh, making those connections is a great spot for me to be in. But, you know, going to a front row, um, that was awesome because uh, they a great group of people over there. And, and uh, you know, honestly, probably we would have continued for a long time had the Martinsville deal not happened last year. So um, without health issues, that goes on. But I was able to see you know, what they're able to do coming from a very, very small team uh, to growing into, you know, I think they have 70 employees over there with a complete fab shop and everything going on there. So um, they were a great example with Bob Jenkins over there of how they scaled a small one car team to at one point a three car team, now back to a two car team. Um, but I was able to see how they did that and, and know, um, you know, the personnel side and who you need, who you don't and uh, where to spend your money. So I think that's the cool part is I've kind of seen every end of the sport and, and so is bj um, on different parts and running his own team so that's uh that's pretty exciting for us is to know that we do know the different aspects of um what different areas of the garage look like certainly yeah a lot of very useful experience um well we are all very much looking forward to hearing about the new team name the driver yeah. potentially everything going forward 2021 is going to be a a very fun year you know it's sort of thought of as a transition year i don't know i don't know if we can say that anymore because of the crazy new schedule with all, i didn't even ask sure. you about that what do no you it's, think, it's definitely different <laughs> what do you think of all the road courses is that something that you think is exciting for now like what do you think of next year? you, you kind of laughed at Bri about bristol dirt like is that like what what do you what are your thoughts on next year's schedule no, I 
I just laughed at that one because I never thought we'd see the Cup Series go to Dirt. I, I thought at some point we would. I just didn't think it was going to be at Bristol. I would have guessed Eldora, to be honest with you, yeah. or uh, something else. But um, I think it's cool we're doing it. You know, our, our grassroots come from dirt racing. But um, as far as the road course racing, I'm pumped about up about that. Um, you know, a lot of my success in my career came on road courses. My good runs came on road courses. So um, that's the one part I will miss is, is going to Road America because I absolutely love that place. That's that's my favorite racetrack. So. So um, I hate that I can't drive that one. That's the one I really wish we could. But um, I'm excited. I think the the cool thing about it is we have a lot of road courses coming in. And I hope we keep on going that route because I think, you know, no longer are the days that, oh, I'm not that good at road courses. You know, or we'll just get through this weekend. You can't do that anymore. Mm-hmm. That's that's what a sixth of the schedule. That's a big portion. Yeah. It's almost as big as the playoffs. I mean, it's six races. The playoffs are 10 races like that is almost an entire um, chunk or a third of the schedule almost in there. So that's where, you know, I think we still will probably see some stuff added in as the years go on. And um, I, I do think it'll change the landscape because you may have across the top three divisions that guys maybe, you know, for Xfinity, they they just come in and buy the road course races or they buy the uh, downforce and the intermediate races um, as far as the teams to split up seasons. And on the cup side, I think you see guys that put a lot more attention with these limited practice days and, and no practice weekends. Um, I think you have to see a lot of guys put in a lot of effort in the simulator, maybe in sports cars, things like that. I mean, you've seen mm-hmm. guys like um, Chase Briscoe and Austin Sindrick. They're in those um, they're in those Ford performance, um, the Continental Tire Series and um, Pirelli stuff and, and yeah. all kinds of things just to try to get better. So I think you'll see a lot of guys put a lot more focus, which is only going to make our um, drivers in the Cup Series truly um, some of the best drivers in the world. Yeah, we've even seen a few of these young drivers. Obviously, everyone talks about Chase Elliott. He has turned into a yeah. one of the best road courses. Like he can hold his own against seemingly almost anyone. I don't. I don't want to eat those words later. <laughs> I on, wouldn't but... say hold his own. He's uh, he was going for Jeff Gordon's record there. He... So I don't know uh, if you can say hold his own anymore. I, mean, I remember uh, an ARCA race going down to watch at New Jersey Motorsports Park, and it was him and Andrew Ranger, fantastic road course driver, um, runs in the Pinty series and. Oh my goodness. The two of them going at it was just epic. So that was before he got his Moss Sport win and everything. But I always knew Chase was a fantastic road course driver because watching him, you always know in practice who the good drivers are because everybody drives to a certain point into the corner and then the good guys drive about five car lengths further. And that was those two. (laughs) Wow. Interesting. Well, that's interesting. You've seen that for a while. I feel like at least for me, it kind of surprised me, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, going to be a wild year next year with all the road courses all the different changing schedules and and new teams like yours so matt we look forward to hearing more about about your new team and and best of luck next season thanks for coming on the show awesome thanks for having me